Welcome to EF Pod English. Brought to you by EF Education First and English Town. Learn anytime, anywhere. Pod English Upper Intermediate 65 War Film. In this lesson, you will learn how to exchange opinions in English. We will talk about asking for people's opinions, how to give your own, and how to disagree with someone. Here are some examples. What did you think of the movie? I think it was brilliant. Let's begin. We are now going to watch a short movie. Two friends went to see a film. And now that it is finished, they share their impressions of the film. Listen to how they describe the movie. So, what did you think of the movie, Jen? I thought it was all right. I'm not a big fan of war movies. But this one seemed realistic and interesting. How about you? What did you think? I thought it was brilliant. To me, it was more than just a war movie. It was complex and profound. Really? I agree it was interesting, but profound? I don't know about that. I mean, it was okay, but still, it is a war movie. I'd rather see a movie that has more of a story. But I think this movie did have a very good story about human nature, not just about war. Really? Human nature? So many of the characters in the movie thought that the war was terrible, and they kept trying to avoid fighting. I thought the way they talked about it was so poetic. It was brilliant and moving. Hmm. I guess so. But there were so many sad scenes, and so many people died. I think I was in the mood for an exciting movie today. I see what you mean. I thought the movie was outstanding, but it was heavy. Let's go. Now let's talk about the language of the movie. The friends do not agree with each other about the movie. One friend asks the other for her opinion. Do you remember what she said? She said, what did you think of the movie, Jen? We often use think of when we ask for an opinion. It is polite to use someone's name when asking them a question. If you do this, put the name at the beginning or end of the question. Jen, what did you think of the movie? Or, what did you think of the movie, Jen? Her friend answered, and she then asked, how about you? What did you think? I think it was brilliant. When you answer, you don't need the word of. <gasps> there are many ways to agree or disagree with someone. In the movie you saw, a few useful expressions are used. The woman, Jen, did not like the movie. She used polite phrases to disagree. For example, she said, I don't know about that. Uh, I guess so. Really? All of these are ways to suggest that you have a different opinion, even if you don't say it. It is now your turn to practice speaking. I will show you part of the movie. Watch the people. Then listen to me. Repeat what I say. So, what did you think of the movie, Jen? What did you think of the movie? Repeat. What did you think of the movie? How about you? What did you think? How about you? What did you think? Repeat. How about you? What did you think? Really? Really? Repeat. Really? 
I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Repeat. I don't know about that. Hmm. I guess so. Uh, I guess so. Repeat. Uh, I guess so. Well done. You have now practiced asking for opinions and disagreeing politely. What did you think of the movie? I think it was brilliant. Really? I don't know about that. Honey. Welcome to EF Pod English. Brought to you by EF Education First and English Town. Learn anytime, anywhere. Pod English, Upper Intermediate 66, Fears. Hello everyone, I'm Jim Landers from Storky Storky. Thank you for coming. As I know you all would like to invest in our factory. That's why you are here and this is why I am here and I am a little bit nervous so please just let me. Thank you. Today's lesson is about expressing feelings. In particular, expressing fears. We're also going to talk about adjectives with prepositions. English uses lots of these combinations. We'll change the world and our company. We will cut through the value chain like no one has done before and we will get closer to our customers than we have ever been. We will sit in the lap of our customer and we will reach all over the world. Kirsten is telling Jen about what she is afraid of. Let's watch. Hey Jen, what's up? Nothing much, how about you? Well, I'm pretty nervous. Nervous? What about? I have to give a presentation tomorrow in front of 50 people. Oh, at your company. Uh-huh. Cool, you must be excited. No way, I'm not good at public speaking. Really? Why? There's nothing to be afraid of. Actually, I like speaking in front of people. I think it's exciting. Are you kidding? You're not scared of speaking in front of a big group? No, I think it's a piece of cake, as long as I have something interesting to talk about. Well, I don't think the topic is boring. I just get nervous about being in the spotlight like that. Hmm. Well, when I'm scared of something, I just try to relax and take it easy. Just remember that your colleagues are interested in what you have to say. Maybe you're right. I don't think I'm good at it, but I guess giving a presentation is nothing to be scared of. Exactly. Just try to relax and I'm sure you'll be fine. And we have decided to invest a lot in research and development. The one who made this possible is Mr. Johnson. Did you follow the conversation? Do you share the same feelings about speaking in public? Now we're going to take a closer look at some of the grammar from the movie. The grammar we'll look at now is the compound formed by an adjective followed by a preposition. For example, when the adjective excited is followed by the preposition about, we have excited about, as in, Kirsten was definitely not excited about her presentation tomorrow. We have another common adjective preposition compound, and that's the phrase good at. 
as in to be good at something. Our example here is I'm not good at public speaking. Another such phrase is surprised by, as in I was surprised by her fear of public speaking. Kirsten was telling Jen how she was afraid of public speaking. Kirsten was afraid of public speaking. Something new has emerged. A new line of rubber. I am proud to present to you our new product rubber line, Rubberific. Our last example for this is bored with. And to put it into the context of Jen and Kirsten's conversation, we could say that Jen was bored with Kirsten's complaints. Read each statement and guess which preposition is correct. Kirsten says she is not a good public speaker. Which preposition fits here? No way! I'm not good at public speaking. At. That's right. Good at. Try another one. Jen says she should not worry. What goes after afraid here? There's nothing to be afraid of. Of. There's nothing to be afraid of. Let's try another. Kirsten asks her friend if she gets scared. What word should come after scared here? You're not scared of speaking in front of a big group? Of. Scared of. She's not scared of speaking in public. Kirsten says something makes her nervous. Which preposition fits here? I just get nervous about being in the spotlight like that. Nervous about. She's nervous about speaking. That brings us to the end of the lesson. Our engineers have worked day and night. A fact that is today bound to be a success. I promise you, success solid as rock. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Today, we've been talking about expressing fears and to use adjectives with prepositions, such as good at, afraid of, nervous about. Is there anyone who has a question? No, okay, then thank you, everyone. And remember, your investment will grow faster than gold. Even if gold cannot grow, your investment will be... Sorry. Nothing is as terrific as rubber, the rubber, rubber is. Thank you. Welcome to EF Pod English. Brought to you by EF Education First and English Town. Learn anytime, anywhere. Pod English, Upper Intermediate, 67. Technology. Today, we're going to learn more about describing high tech gadgets by combining several adjectives. Before we watch the movie, Let's have a look at parts of the dialogue on their own. Look at my new fancy gadget. So this is like saying, look at my new cool electronic device. It's a PDA, so it's a personal digital assistant. It's a wireless multi-platform web-enabled browser. So it doesn't need any cables or wires works on many platforms such as Windows or Mac and it can surf the internet. It's a solar powered, voice activated, memory expandable phone. So my PDA is powered by the sun. It doesn't need batteries. I can talk to my phone and tell it to do things. 
and the memory can be increased if I want it to be. Now we've had that preview, let's watch the movie. Hey, I see you've bought yourself a new fancy gadget here. Hey, I'm an early adopter of new technology. That's the latest PDA. Personal digital assistant, right? What does it do? Well, on the one hand, it's a wireless, multi-platform, web-enabled browser. My handheld does that. But on the other hand, it's a solar-powered, voice-activated, memory-expandable phone. My phone's rechargeable, but not solar-powered. I have my bills paid, my music collection catalogued, and all of my photos stored on its built-in memory. So what happens if you lose it? Well, in case of loss or theft, all of the password-protected data is automatically backed up to a web account once a day. I'm actually quite impressed. Did you know that English uses a specific order for adjectives if you have more than one? Take a look at this example. She has a small, square, black laptop computer. In English, we put adjectives in a specific order before the noun. First size, like small. Shape, like square. Color, like black. Origin, like Japanese. Material, like metal. And function, such as laptop. If you pay attention, you will see this order repeated all the time. People also combine adjectives to make compounds. Two words working as one word. You will see more of this in a minute. In this part, you're going to listen to my description of what the PDA can do. Think of the right adjective to fit this description. Then, we can see how Dennis describes it in the movie. Now how else can I say, well on the one hand, it doesn't need any cables or wires. It works on many platforms such as Windows, Mac, Linux, etc. And it can surf the internet. Well, on the one hand, it's a wireless, multi-platform, web-enabled browser. That's right. You can say, well, on the one hand, it's a wireless, multi-platform, web-enabled browser. Now, what can I say instead of, on the other hand, it's powered by the sun, I can talk to my phone and tell it to do things, and the memory can be increased if I want it to be. But on the other hand, it's a solar-powered, voice-activated, memory-expandable phone. Good. The correct answer is, on the other hand, it's a solar-powered, voice-activated, memory-expandable phone. As you can see, there are a lot of things you can do with adjectives. Put them in order, combine them into compound words, and generally sound very high-tech. See you again soon. Welcome to EF Pod English. Brought to you by EF Education First and English Town. Learn anytime, anywhere. Pod English Upper Intermediate 68. Religion. Today we're going to talk about different religions from around the world and what they mean to different people. Let's take a look at the movie. Jessica has just returned from a trip to Thailand where she visited a Buddhist monastery. So what was the most interesting thing you saw on your trip to Asia? Well, in Thailand I saw a Buddhist temple where thousands of monks actually live. Fascinating. Did you get to talk to any of them? No, they don't speak English. But I did try sitting and meditating with them. I don't know that much about Eastern philosophy or religion. I was brought up Christian. Mm. What about yourself? Actually, I'm Jewish, but my parents always taught me to try and respect and understand other religions. I went to church as a kid, but my parents thought I should choose on my own what religion to follow when I became a teenager. That's cool. Sounds like both our parents are pretty liberal about religious beliefs. So, did you celebrate holidays like Christmas? No, not in a spiritual way, but I do exchange gifts with my friends. I guess for a lot of people, Christmas isn't much of a religious holiday anymore, is it? Well, the world is changing. 
a lot of traditional customs and practices are altering or disappearing. You think religion will cease to be important? Maybe. But religion plays a big part in so many people's lives. Just ask the monks. Let's look more closely at what Jessica and Erica said. And I saw a Buddhist temple where thousands of monks actually live. I saw a Buddhist temple where thousands of monks actually live. A temple is a house of worship, a place where people can go to meditate or pray. Buddhists often have temples. I don't know that much about Eastern philosophy or religion. I was brought up Christian. Mm. I don't know that much about Eastern philosophy or religion. I was brought up Christian. Eastern philosophy and religion comes from Asia. Sounds like both our parents are pretty liberal about religious beliefs. Sounds like both our parents are pretty liberal about religious beliefs. Here, liberal means that they are not strict. Jessica could make her own choices in life. In this part, we're going to listen to my description of a religious term, and then you have to guess what it is. What is the name for people who live in a monastery? Jessica met some in Thailand. The correct answer is a monk. Now what is the name for a set of spiritual beliefs, values, faiths and practices? That would be a religion or faith. And finally, what could be a building dedicated to religious ceremonies or worship? It could be a church or a temple. Well done for completing those exercises. Today we've talked about different religions from around the world. Thanks for joining me this lesson and I hope to see you again soon. Welcome to EF Pod English, brought to you by EF Education First and English Town. Learn anytime, anywhere. Pod English, Upper Intermediate 69. Interview. Today we're going to learn how to describe yourself at a job interview using compound adjectives such as hard working, easy going. Good with people. Very well organized. Where I see myself in five years. Thanks for coming in to talk about the volunteer position. You're an accountant, right? Yes, that's right. I ran an accountancy firm for five years, but then I sold the business.
Welcome to EF Pod English. Brought to you by EF Education First and English Town. Learn anytime, anywhere. Pod English Upper Intermediate 70. Computers. This is the new computer. Today, you will be learning about computer and internet related terminology. Oh, oh it always happens. Make note of what kind of language is used to explain how to find something on the internet. We're now going to watch a movie about someone teaching her friend how to use the internet. Jane, I want to find the weather forecast for tomorrow. What do I need to do? First, you need to be connected to the internet. Oh, right. So I use the mouse to click on this icon here on the desktop, right? Yes, and then wait while the computer dials up. Why is it taking so long?
Welcome to EF Pod English. Brought to you by EF Education First and English Town. Learn anytime, anywhere. Pod English Upper Intermediate 71. Law. This is Barry T. Stanley, the true voice of the people. We'll fight for you. In today's podcast, we're going to have a look at some legal terms. Verbs like to sue, to charge, cross-examine, defense lawyer, jury, verdict. I have helped thousands of consumers over the years to sue for the compensation they deserve. Being involved in an automobile accident is horrible enough. What is worse is having to battle insurance companies to get your medical bills paid, your car fixed, and so on. Now let's take a look at that movie and make note of what special legal words they use to describe the situation. Good afternoon, Mrs. Johnson. I see you've injured your arm. How did that happen? I was knocked down by a driver several days ago and I broke my wrist. I'm afraid I'll be off work for three months or more. How inconvenient. Can I help you in any way? I hope so. I'd like to sue the driver for lost earnings. The police have charged him with reckless driving. OK. I'll need to take detailed notes about the accident. Are there any witnesses? Yes. Two people gave statements to the police saying that the man was driving too fast. That's very good. I can put together a case for you before the trial. Can you explain the court proceedings to me? You will appear before the court and be cross-examined by the defence lawyers. You may also be asked to identify the defendant. As the lawyer for the prosecution, I will act on your behalf. And what should I say? Just tell the judge exactly what you saw. Stick to the facts you gave in your statement at the time of the crash. And when I finished? Then the jury will take your testimony into consideration and reach a verdict. A lot of people don't know their rights. That's why the law offices of Barry T. Stanley is there for you. Carla was hurt by a driver. What's happened to the driver? The police have charged him with reckless driving. The police have charged him with reckless driving. To charge. The police have charged the driver. This means that the police have written a formal statement. The statement says that the driver is accused of a crime. Let's look at the crime the driver has been accused of. Reckless driving. This means that the driver was driving dangerously. So what does Carla want to do? I'd like to sue the driver for lost earnings. Carla wants to sue the driver. To sue means to take someone to court because you think they are responsible for a problem and you want them to pay you money. Carla couldn't work for three months and so she wants to sue the driver for lost earnings. The lawyer later explains to Carla what will happen when she goes to the court. You will appear before the court and be cross-examined by the defence lawyers. So Carla will be cross-examined. This means that the lawyer for the driver will ask her detailed questions. The lawyer for the driver is called the defence lawyer. And what will happen towards the end of the court case? Then, the jury will take your testimony into consideration and reach a verdict. The jury is a group of people chosen from the public. They will decide whether the driver is guilty or not guilty. Verdict is another word for a decision. How can you be sure you're being treated fairly by the insurance companies? That's why the law offices of Barry T. Stanley are there for you. We know the law, we know what you deserve, you have rights and you don't have to fight alone. 
Now see if you can remember some of those legal terms. Carla was hurt in an accident. What action does she want to take? Carla wants to sue the driver. Can you fill in the gap here? Well done. The police have charged the driver. Can you fill in the gap here? Here's a hint. The phrase we are looking for means to ask detailed questions. That's right. The defense lawyer will cross-examine Carla. And finally, can you remember the word we use for the decision that the jury will make? The verdict. The jury will reach the verdict. Excellent work! You've learned a lot of new legal terms today. Let's take a final look at them. To sue, to charge, to cross-examine, defense lawyer, the jury, the verdict. We've also learned what reckless driving means. We know the law. We know what you deserve. You have rights, and you don't have to fight alone. Because we'll fight for you. Call now. Welcome to EF Pod English. Brought to you by EF Education First and English Town. Learn anytime, anywhere. Pod English, Upper Intermediate, seventy-two. Travel itinerary. Morning. There's ticket. Passport. We're going to look at some useful words we use when we talk about travelling. We're also going to look at when and how to use unless. But first, let's watch the movie. Yes. Anna needs to leave work early. Why? I'm flying direct to Sydney. Excuse me, I have to leave early. Okay, how come? It's my niece. She's at the airport. She's on her way to Japan. She said the travel agent gave her the wrong itinerary. She said she has to make three connections to get to Japan, and it will take two days to fly there. It's gonna take two days. What's the problem? She has to fly to Rome, then Paris. Then Singapore and finally Japan. Really? She's going to Paris, and she needs to change planes in Rome and then Singapore. No, it's Rome first and then Paris second. That doesn't make any sense. That's a bad itinerary. Why do you have to go to the airport? She told me she has to pay a hundred dollar fee to change her ticket. She doesn't have any money. It sounds like she didn't prepare very well. Doesn't it? No, she didn't. But she is a teenager, and she hasn't travelled before. But unless she changes her ticket before her departure, she'll go to Rome, and she won't be able to get a direct flight to Japan.、Hmm. Why not just call the travel agent? It's six fifteen. They close at six. Well, hurry up. You don't want to get there after they've made the boarding announcements. I don't believe it. They've cancelled my flight. Can't believe they've cancelled my flight. Oh dear, what has gone wrong? I think Anna's niece needs some help. Don't you? Let's see again what the problem is. It's my niece. She's at the airport. She's on her way to Japan. She said the travel agent gave her the wrong itinerary. The itinerary is the problem. Anna's niece has been given the wrong itinerary. An itinerary is a travel schedule. It's a bit like a timetable for your holiday. So what does Anna's niece need to do? She said she has to make three connections to get to Japan, and it will take two days to fly there. Her niece has to make three connections. This means that she has to change airplanes three times in one journey. 
Well, no one wants to spend two days travelling in an airplane, so Anna's niece has to change her ticket. Excuse me. Yes, ma'am. My flight has just been cancelled. 20 minutes ago, you're telling me to board the aircraft. Now my flight is cancelled. How am I ever going to get to Sydney in 24 hours? Unless she changes her ticket, before her departure, she'll go to Rome and she won't be able to get a direct flight to Japan. Unless she changes her ticket before her departure, she won't be able to get a direct flight to Japan. Unless means the same as if, not. This is the same as saying, if she doesn't change her ticket, she won't be able to get a direct flight to Japan. So Anna has to go to the airport to pay the $100 for the new ticket. Why is it important for her to leave quickly? Was it if I still... Sydney! Sydney! Sydney? Let me check, ma'am. Checking. Checking, checking. Always checking. Well, hurry up. You don't want to get there after they've made the boarding announcements. Because if she arrives after the boarding announcements have been made, her niece might miss the flight. A boarding announcement sounds like this. Flight 244 to Hawaii is boarding at gate 65. I would like to fly with a different airline. Can you please... OK, I would like my luggage back. I would like to fly with a different airline, please. I'm not waiting around for a boarding announcement. I please have my luggage back. I demand to have my luggage back. Well, now it's your turn to practice what you've learnt today. Can you fill in the missing word here? Here's a hint. The word we're looking for means to change planes. I hope I don't miss my connection. Can you remember what we call this? Flight 244 to Hawaii is boarding at gate 65. That's right, it's a boarding announcement. So what about this? Can you remember a word which might fit in here? Excellent! The word we're looking for is itinerary. Anna's niece has a bad itinerary. And how can I rephrase this sentence so it uses the word unless? If she doesn't change her ticket, she won't be able to get a direct flight. We could say, unless she changes her ticket, she won't be able to get a direct flight. That brings me to the next point. We've learned some useful words to do with travelling, like connection, itinerary and boarding announcement. We've also looked at how to use unless. Thanks for joining me in this lesson. I hope I can see you again soon. Bye for now. Welcome to EF Pod English, brought to you by EF Education First and English Town. Learn anytime, anywhere. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Can I help you? Yeah, I got a ticket. It's okay. I'm sorry, sir. Not today. You haven't. Uh, Special event today, sir. What? Pod English Upper Intermediate 73. Sightseeing. Uh, this is an all-access card to historical sites all over the UK. Can't you just give me a few minutes to run up and touch the stone and I'll be right back. I'm sorry, sir. If it was up to me, I would. But it's not my rule, sir. We are closed. Uh, who, who put up that sign then? In this lesson, we'll look at how articles like a and the are used in common phrases in place names and for holidays. For example, I had a great time travelling in the US. I had the time of my life in Australia. So there's nothing you can do, huh? I'm afraid not, sir. Tell you what. Oh, I think that's my wallet. You know, there may be a hundred dollars in there, or there may not be, if you know what I mean. 
Why don't uh, you keep an eye on that while I run in and touch the stone? Sir, I am a member of the British government. We don't accept bribes. That's not what I heard. You're now going to watch a movie where two friends discuss cultures in different countries. After the movie, you'll have a quick lesson and you'll have a chance to practice the articles the and a. Where do you want to go sightseeing today? I want to visit this temple I've read about in the guidebook. OK, but I will buy the entrance ticket. Oh, I didn't realize we have to pay to get in. Yes, in China there is a small fee to enter museums, parks and temples. That's very different from back home. Have you ever heard of anyone paying to get into church? You're right. In the West you do not need to make a direct payment at the entrance. But the congregation is usually expected to make a small contribution during collection. Oh, so you've been to England before? Yes, I went there last year. I had the time of my life. Although, it took a few days to adjust. The two cultures are so different. Well, this is my first visit to China, and I've heard this temple is amazing. When was it built? Pretty recently, about 150 years ago. Well, that seems very old to me. Considering China's 5,000-year-old history, it's relatively new. Do you go to that temple? No, but my parents do. To pray? No. Nowadays people just come here to pray for good luck and money. A similar trend is occurring in the West, especially in regard to festivals. Many people still celebrate Christmas, although they might not be churchgoers. Yes, it's interesting. We should find a taxi and go. Oh, I think someone is trying to get in over there. Hey, come back. Yeah, well, I'm not... <clears throat> okay. Have a nice day, sir. Now let's look more closely at some of the words and phrases where articles like a and the are used. In the West, the time of my life. In these phrases, we always use the definite article the. I had the time of my life. With the word few, we often use the indefinite article a, a few days. It took a few days to adjust. And there are some words and phrases where we never use an article at all. This is my first visit to China. We don't use any article before most country names and holidays. For example, you can say, We celebrate Christmas at my house. I love going to France. It's easy to remember with a little practice. Give it a try. Where does the sun set? The sun sets in the west. How do you say you had a really excellent time? I had the time of my life. What do you know about these places? Brazil. My favorite coffee comes from Brazil. Egypt. Everyone knows the famous pyramids are in Egypt. What do you know about these celebrations? Easter. Easter is celebrated in the spring. Halloween. Halloween is very popular in the US. We don't use any article before most country names and holidays. Now just when you thought it was clear, be careful. There are a few exceptions. Sometimes we need the before a country name. Can you guess why? That's right. When the name includes United, Union or Republic, you use the definite article the. Well done. Not you again, sir. Listen, I'm supposed to have the time of my life here. I've seen all the historical sites in the UK, except for these rocks. Can you just please let me in for a couple of minutes? I'm sorry, sir. I'm sure you could have the time of your life anywhere in the UK, but not here today. Oh, man, I can't believe this. Well, you know what? Go there, on, there beat it, go. sir. Today, we've talked about how to use the articles a and the. We use a and the in common phrases such as in the West. I had the time of my life. We don't use any article before most country names and holidays. My favorite coffee comes from Brazil. We also talked about some exceptions. 
such as the United States of America. I hope you enjoyed the lesson. It is important to practice as much as you can. Watch the movie again for more examples of using the and a. See you next time. Welcome to EF Pod English. Brought to you by EF Education First and English Town. Learn anytime, anywhere. Pod English Upper Intermediate 74. Investor Talk. In this lesson, we're going to look at some grammar that you use often. Relative clauses. These give us important information about a noun. For example, the plant that produces cars. Now let's watch the following short film where two colleagues are discussing a visit. Did it go well or badly? Hello. Hi, Michelle. Oh, hi, Greg. What's up? I just got an email from my investor, Mr. Fernandez. He wanted me to thank you for showing him around last week. Uh, did he get to see everything that he wanted? Yeah, he was really interested in checking out the factories that are making the new line of cars, so I took him out there and George, the plant manager, gave him a tour. Good. Did he visit our research and development offices? Yeah, we spent a full day there. Mr Fernandez spoke with an R&D engineer who developed the new engine for us last year. What was the name of that engineer that you spoke with? Uh, Jim Landers, I think. Is Jim the one who uh, has that Australian accent? He's um, kind of tall. Uh, the one who has a beard, right? Yeah, that's the one. Do you know him? Yes, he's one of our best engineers. He helped set up the new plant. I'm glad Mr. Fernandez could meet him. Yeah, me too. Anyway, after touring R&D in the factories, I brought Mr. Fernandez to the head office, where we met up with the CFO and a few of the board of directors. And uh, everything went smoothly? Yeah, he seemed to be very pleased with what he saw and very excited about the new projects. He said he'll give us a final decision next week. So did the visit go well or badly? It sounds like it went well, didn't it? The visitor spoke to all the right people. Hello? Hello. Yes, it's Humphrey. Humphrey Middlesworth, of course. He met people who could answer his questions. In this sentence, the word who tells us we have a relative clause. Here's another example from the movie. Mr. Fernandez spoke with an R&D engineer who developed the new engine for us last year. Which engineer did he speak with? He spoke with the engineer who developed the new engine. This information is really important. It helps us identify which engineer out of maybe hundreds. This is called a defining relative clause. It gives us key information about a noun. Without this information, we can't understand the meaning of the sentence. Let's see another example from the movie. Is Jim the one who uh, has that Australian accent? He's um, kind of tall. Uh, the one who has a beard, right? Ah, we're getting closer. Now we know he's the one who has an Australian accent. And just in case you still don't know which engineer, he's the tall guy who has a beard. Yep, that's Jim. The defining relative clause tells us exactly who Jim is. Did you also notice that there are no commas? In defining relative clauses, we don't use commas. This is because the information is key to understanding the meaning of the sentence. So how do we make a relative clause? Who is one of several words that can signal a relative clause. We use who or that for people. The man who lives next door. 
this is the same as the man that lives next door. We use that with things. The machine that broke down is now working. And we use where for places. Mr. Fernandez went to the head offices where he met up with a few of the board of directors. The restaurant where we had dinner was very cheap. Hello. Hello, yes, good afternoon. Humphrey Middlesworth here. Hello? Hello? Damn! Now it's time for you to have a go. Can you make this into one sentence using a relative clause? The man saw the accident. He phoned the police. Yes, that's right. The man who saw the accident phoned the police. You could also use that. The man that saw the accident phoned the police. Let's try another. The train goes to the airport. It leaves every half hour. Well done. The train that goes to the airport leaves every half hour. Now fill in the gap. Well done. The place where we went on holiday was beautiful. Good, but you don't know what an umbrella hat is. OK. And you've just gone bankrupt. Ah, OK. Maybe you're not the investors for us then. Well done. Today we've been defining relative clauses. Who, that, where are some of the words that can signal a relative clause. Oh, nobody wants to buy my umbrella hat. Thanks for joining us and see you again soon. Welcome to EF Pod English. Brought to you by EF Education First and English Town. Learn anytime, anywhere. Pod English, <laughs> Upper Intermediate 75. Getting help. This lesson, you'll practice pronunciation of words beginning with the huh sound, and we'll look at using the verb do for emphasis. Hello, I'm Harry, the happy homeless person. It's very hot today. I think I'd better find some shade. We're now going to watch a short movie, and after that, we'll have a short quiz. Are you okay? <laughs> a big truck came out of nowhere, hit my car and drove away. Everything is such a mess. How could this have happened? Hmm. Take it easy, okay? We, we, have you called the police? No. In the confusion, I forgot. I can't believe this. I just spent $500 on repairs last week. Mm -hmm. Are you okay? You aren't hurt. No, that's a relief, but my neck does hurt. Oh, maybe, maybe you are hurt. All right, we're going to call the hospital just in case. Why me? Why couldn't that truck have hit someone else? This is the last thing I need right now. 911, how can I help you? I'd like to report a hit-and-run car accident. My friend has just had her car wrecked and she might be hurt. Okay, sir, what's the address? The address is 119 East Main Street. Please hurry. Now it's time for the quiz. What exactly happened to Vivian? A big truck came out of nowhere, hit my car and drove away. A truck hit her car and then drove away without stopping. Greg later called this a hit and run. What does Greg want to know about Vivian? Do you remember? Are you okay? You aren't hurt. He asked her if she was hurt. And did she say yes or no? Was she hurt? No, that's a relief, but my neck does hurt. Vivian said her neck hurt. 
Notice she used the auxiliary verb does before the verb hurt. We often include do or does to add emphasis or to clarify information. Vivian wasn't hurt badly, so she said no at first. But on second thoughts, she did feel some pain. To make it clear, she uses does. So what did Greg do next? 911, how can I help you? I'd like to report a hit and run car accident. My friend has just had her car wrecked and she might be hurt. Greg called for help. How can I help you? Hit, hurt, help. All these words start with the voiced h sound. Here's a very useful phrase we learned today. This is the last thing I need. We use this expression when we feel frustrated or angry, when we have too much bad luck. Why me? Why couldn't that truck have hit someone else? This is the last thing I need right now. <laughs> now let's test your memory. Do you remember what it's called when someone drives away without stopping after causing an accident? You did remember. It's called a hit and run. And do you remember what verb we use for emphasis? Yes, you do remember. And you're right, I did just use it. And can you remember a phrase we learned in the film which we use when we are frustrated or angry about something? Well done. The answer is, this is the last thing I need. In this lesson, you practiced the pronunciation of H. You learned how to use do for emphasis, and you learned the phrases hit and run, and this is the last thing I need. Welcome to EF Pod English, brought to you by EF Education First and English Town. Learn anytime, anywhere. Pod English, Upper Intermediate, 76, Office Tour. Hello, are you Eric? Hi, my name is John. I'm from the IT department. I came to set up your computer and, and after you, you, you go on the office tours. So, it, yeah, it's quite complicated, but... In today's lesson, we'll look at the difference between the words quite and rather. You'll also learn how to answer questions that start with, Do you mind if... It's, it's a, it's a X1, Y, X. Well, are you ready to watch the movie? You do, Dad. I need to go on an office tour. Uh, I know, but the email is important. Caroline is a receptionist. She is showing Kate around her office. Sorry I'm a bit late. Traffic was atrocious. No problem. Well, I'll be showing you around today. Shall we get started? Let's do it. As you can see, it's an open plan office. Yes, it's rather large. How many people work here? We employ approximately 100 in this office alone. We've also got two plants outside the city with another 250 staff. So quite a large company then. A very small company, considering we are a public limited company. I guess we are medium sized. So what do they do down here? That's our sales department. That's our marketing department. And this is reception, right? Yes, this is our main reception area. Oh, the phone's ringing. Mind if I answer it? There's one thing missing. Oh. Oh, okay. The usual way to answer a question that starts with, do you mind if I... And the is no, go here. ahead. And 
Oh, sorry. It means no, I don't mind. Here are some other common phrases we use. No, not at all. No, go ahead. And no, of course not. Pay attention. Let's look at some examples. Do you mind if I sit down? No, not at all. Did you catch what Kate was sorry for? Sorry I'm a bit late. Traffic was atrocious. She said, sorry I'm late. Traffic was atrocious. Atrocious is another word for terrible. Now let's look closely at the language Kate used to describe the office and the company. Kate says the office is rather large. Then she says, it's quite a large company. Note that quite is followed by a or an. It's quite a large company. In these two sentences, rather and quite mean the same thing. We can use either of them to describe something that is between a little and very. But there are a few small differences. Let's look at rather first. You can use rather to express something unexpected or unusual. For example, your business plan is rather good. It's better than I'd hoped for. We also use rather when we want to express negative feelings. For example, the network is rather slow today. In contrast, we often use quite when we are feeling happy about something. For example, I was able to download the file quite quickly. One thing to be careful about, however, is that quite can sometimes mean absolutely. For example, are you sure? Yes, I'm quite sure. This means I'm completely sure. Here are some sentences. Decide if you should use quite or rather in each gap. Can you do this one? We use rather. It's rather hot today for winter time, isn't it? We use rather because it is unusual or unexpected for it to be hot in winter. Can you do this one? It's quite a large company. That's quite an impolite question. Or, that's rather an impolite question. That was quite an achievement. In this lesson, you learn the correct answer for Do you mind if? You learn the word atrocious. And you now know the differences between quite and rather. Hello? What is this? Uh, uh, this, is, this is your computer. But where is my laptop? I, 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 I changed it. I, it was, was not working very well, so I, I, I changed it. It's, 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 this is rather big, but it's, it's, it's huge. I, 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 no, but I can't bring this to meetings. This is this is faster. I mean, you can check. I don't you care if it's fast. You can, you can check. I can bring this, and it, you, can, you can set up your your firewall here. And, and, it, and you know, it, it's, it's safety is really important and security. Yeah, but I want my laptop. I, I, I know, I know, but 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 I mean, think about it. This 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 is much bigger and and, and it's faster and secure. It's, it's it's a lot better. And it, you know, there are a lot of people in this company who. You know, they don't have this kind of computer. You, you are, you are very I lucky. I don't want this. I know, I know, I know but, 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 but think about it. You are lucky. This is a much better than what I have. And, you know, I, 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 Welcome to EF Pod English. Brought to you by EF Education First and English Town. Learn anytime, anywhere. Pod English Upper Intermediate 77 Studying English 
In today's lesson, we're going to learn how to use linking words, also called discourse markers. We're going to look at using well and for example. Before we watch the movie, I'll teach you some vocabulary which may be new to you. For example, variations. We use this word when there is a slight difference between things of the same type. For example, there are many variations of the Chinese language. This means although there is one language, it may be different from place to place. Linguistics. This is the study of languages. Are you ready to watch the movie? An examiner is asking a student several questions about his study plans. OK, let me start by asking you a little about yourself. Why are you studying English? Mainly because English allows me to communicate with people from all over the world. And I hope to study abroad and maybe even work in an English-speaking country one day. So, where do you hope to study? Well, I've applied to several places in the States, and one in England. And what would you like to study? Well, I'm interested in reading, so maybe I'll study English literature. I'm also quite interested in linguistics, so maybe I'll study languages as well. OK. So you're interested in the different variations of English spoken around the world. Can you tell me some of the differences between American and British English? Well, for one example, the present perfect tense is less commonly used in American English. For example, a British speaker will say, have you eaten? But an American speaker will say, did you eat? Good. Can you think of anything else? Well, there are many variations in vocabulary. For example, Discourse markers such as well, for example, indicate what's coming next and they connect ideas when we speak. They also give us a little bit of time to think. How does the student start his answer when the examiner asks, what do you hope to study? Let's watch again to see. Well, I'm interested in reading, so maybe I'll study English literature. He says, well, I've always enjoyed reading, so I hope to study English literature. The student uses well to gain some time while he thinks of his answer. Let's look at another example from the movie. What does he do here? Well, for one example, the present perfect tense is less commonly used in American English. For example, a British speaker will say, have you eaten? But an American speaker will say, did you eat? The student answers the question and then wants to link his answer to more information. So he says, for example, by saying for example, the listener knows what's coming next too. First, let's listen to some examples using discourse markers, then repeat. Well, I've applied to several places in the States and one in England. Let's repeat that. Well, I've applied to several places in the States and one in England. Let's try another one. Well, I'm interested in reading, so maybe I'll study English literature. Now repeat after me again. Well, I've always enjoyed reading, so I hope to study English literature. Well done. Today, we've learned about two discourse markers. Well, for example. Join us again soon for another lesson. Bye. Welcome to EF Pod English. Brought to you by EF Education First and English Town. Learn anytime, anywhere. Pod English, Upper Intermediate, 78. Sales figures. I got fired yesterday for being incompetent. It was my own fault, but what can you do? I guess just sit at home and watch TV.
Are you ready for our lesson today? Today we're going to focus on some useful modal verbs. We're going to look at some ways of using should, might, and would. We're also going to learn some new words about market reports and sales figures. Before we watch a short movie, I'll teach you some vocabulary which may be new to you. Revenue. This is the money coming into a company or organization. Revenue. Quarter. The year is divided into four parts. Three months make up one quarter. Quarter. Are you ready to watch the movie? We are going to watch Peter and Jane discussing sales figures and what needs to be done. Okay. As you can see from my report, we're doing well in most sectors. However, sales in Western Europe are down by 5% since July, so we need to focus on that today. Almost 30% of our revenue was coming from Western Europe at the start of this year. Now it's close to 25%. What's the reason? Well, we decreased our advertising budget by almost half this year. I think that might be reflected in our sales. I'm not sure about that. Sales figures are up 20% in Spain this quarter, and we have almost no advertising coverage there. How do you explain that? Simple. The sales team in Barcelona is excellent. I think once we establish a stronger training program, sales should pick up in Europe. What other factors do we need to consider? Well, we can't leave out market forces. What effect has the introduction of the euro had on sales? Well, it's hard to say for sure at this early stage. But software sales in the region are down 3% this quarter, and they're predicted to fall by another half percent before the end of the year. How about Latin America? Let's see. In Mexico, there's been a 15% increase this quarter. So, would you say Europe was our main area of concern right now? Yes, definitely. So why did I get fired? Quite straightforward, really. Not enough sales. Sales this year were meant to be this big, and they turned out to be about this big. Well, actually, I lie more like this. Oh dear! And I thought I it doesn't sound like long. things are going very well in Western oh, yeah. Europe. Oh, yeah. Why? Let's listen to Jane again. Well. We decreased our advertising budget by almost half this year. I think that might be reflected in our sales. She says, "I think that might be reflected in our sales." By using might, she talks about possibility. Look at these sentences. I might go to visit my parents tomorrow. They might not arrive in time. Both sentences use might to talk about possibility. I think once we establish a stronger training program, sales should pick up in Europe. But no, no one wanted to do what I wanted to do, and my boss overruled me, and so sales didn't come in. And huh, now, now, now I'm the one that gets fired. Just a scapegoat. Jane says that sales should pick up in Europe. This means that sales in Europe are expected to get better. Once they do certain actions, we use should when we expect something to happen. Let's look at another example of a modal from the movie. Notice how Peter asks Jane if he understood things correctly. So, would you say Europe was our main area of concern right now? Peter says. So, would you say Europe was our main area of concern right now? He uses would. To ask for Jane's opinion or advice on what to do. Product was meant to taste as good as the cream in these cookies. But instead, tasted like the onions and these crisps. Terrible. Good work. Well, now it's your turn to practice using some of those modal verbs. 
See if you can fill in the blanks with a modal. That's right, we use might here because we are talking of possibility. Wow, look at those dark clouds, it might rain. Well done. Let's try one more. Fill in the blank with a modal. Exactly, the modal we need here is should. If they don't spend all their money tonight, they should have enough for the train home tomorrow. What about this gap? Can you remember what goes in here? So, would you say Europe was our main area of concern right now? Well done! Today we've looked at words that relate to sales figures and market reports. We worked on modals, specifically should, might and would. <sighs> Better go and look for another job. I'm not going to find a job sat on my couch, am I? See you guys later. Join us again soon for another lesson. Welcome to EF Pod English. Brought to you by EF Education First and English Town. Learn anytime, anywhere. Pod English Upper Intermediate. 79. Girl Talk. I'm so depressed. I've just been dumped. In this lesson, we're going to learn how and when to use so and such in English. Henry is so busy. Brian is such a funny guy. I never seem to be able to find anyone who wants to have a real relationship. A serious relationship. I'm so sad. I'm so emotional. I'm just so angry. Well, it's time for the movie now. And you'll like this one. It's about dating. Before we watch the movie, let's look at some words you might not know check out. This means to try something. Let's check out that new restaurant. A dry spell. We use this when we talk about not doing something for a long time. Like, have you had any dates recently? No, it's been a bit of a dry spell. Personal ad. A personal ad is short for a personal advertisement. Well, now we know what a personal ad is, let's watch the movie. Sandy is talking to her friend Emma. Why is Emma sad? Do you want to go to a movie tonight, Sandy? Can't. I have a date with Brian. We're going to check out that new Thai restaurant. You know, the one that just opened on Market Street. Emma? It's just that I haven't, you know, had a date in... Well, a long time. We all go through dry spells, Emma. How long has it been? Six months? Try 18 months. You haven't had a date in a year and a half? What's wrong with you? Have you been hiding under a rock or something? It's so depressing. I just can't seem to meet anyone. I don't know what to do. How did you meet Brian? I answered his personal ad. I'll never forget it. It said, short, ugly guy looking for tall, gorgeous redhead with low expectations. But you don't have red hair and you're not tall. True, but Brian's ad made me laugh. He's such a funny guy and humor is very important to me. Well, I guess I could give it a try then. Yeah, that's the spirit. I just can't believe he dumped me, you know? Like, what was he thinking anyway? So, why is Emma sad? Emma is sad 
or depressed because she hasn't met anyone for a long time. Let's look at what Emma says. It's so depressing. I just can't seem to meet anyone. I don't know what to do. Poor Emma. She says it's so depressing. I just can't seem to meet anyone. Emma uses so before the adjective to make the adjective stronger. It's so depressing. We can also use so with adverbs. He walked so quickly. Let's look at some more examples. Henry is so busy. Jackie talks so quietly I can hardly hear her. What would my ad say? I guess I should write an ad about me. So it might say, kind of cute, kind of chubby. Well, we know that we use so before an adjective or an adverb. But when do we use such? Let's listen to Sandy describing her boyfriend, Brian. Brian's ad made me laugh. He's such a funny guy. And humour is very important to me. Brian is such a funny guy. Lucky Sandy. We use such before an adjective and a noun. It also makes the adjective stronger. Here are some examples. Paris is such a beautiful city. It is such a lovely day today. Ooh, this one looks good. Short, ugly guy looking for tall, gorgeous redhead. He seems to be such a funny guy. I like this one. This one could be the one. Now it's your turn to try. Decide when to use so and when to use such. Here's the first one. It's so depressing. Let's try another one. He's such a nice guy. Well done. Thank you so much for dinner. We had such a nice time. I want to get line dry. Want to lose weight? Well done. You now know when to use so and when to use such. We use so before an adjective or an adverb. We use such before an adjective and a noun. It's so depressing. He's such a nice guy. I've been dumped for four. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Just gonna go with the rolls, go with the blows. Welcome to EF Pod English, brought to you by EF Education First and English Town. Learn anytime, anywhere. Pod English Upper Intermediate 80 Bookstore. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the difference between say and tell. You can tell me anything. I promise I won't say a word. We'll also learn about a useful phrasal verb to end up. Let's watch the movie now. The movie takes place in a bookshop. The customer wants to improve her English. Does that sound familiar? Let's take a look. Hi, can I help you? Yes, I'm looking for something to expand my vocabulary. I bought a few books last year, but they're not very effective. Do you have any suggestions? Well, we have some books on tape. You can listen to them and read along. I've heard great things about this series. How about these? Yes, that might work. Then I can listen on my way to work. And we have English movies on the third floor. Maybe that could help your vocabulary. Yes, but I always end up turning the subtitles on. Anyway, thanks for the suggestion. I'll head up there later. You know, my son is studying English at school now, and they use a website to study. Really? Do you remember the address? What did he tell me? 
I, I think it's EnglishTown.com. He says it's great. I'll check it out. Thanks very much. Let's look at the difference between say and tell. What's the difference? When do we use say and when do we use tell? Here's an example from the movie using both. What did he tell me? I, I think it's EnglishTown.com. He says it's great. What did he tell me? I think it's EnglishTown.com. He says it's great. What did he tell me? We use tell here because we have an object to tell somebody. Here me is the object. What did he tell me? Can you tell me how to improve my English? The teacher told the children to be quiet. So when do we use say? He says it's great. He told me it's great. Can you see the difference with this sentence? We use say in the sense of speak, often used in indirect speech. He says it's great. We use told in he told me it's great because we have an object, me, in the sentence. Can you say it again, please? Well, we're now going to look at a useful phrasal verb from the movie. The customer likes watching movies in English, but what always happens? Yes, but I always end up turning the subtitles on. I always end up turning the subtitles on. She doesn't plan to watch the movie with subtitles, but in the end, this is what she does. We often use end up when we don't expect something to happen. Well, why don't you have a go? Complete the sentences with say or tell. Here's the first one. That's good. He says it's great. Here's another. That's right, we use tell here. What did he tell me? Well done. I always end up turning the subtitles on. Well done. You now know how to use tell and when to use say. He told me it's great. He says it's great. We've also practiced the phrase end up. Well, I hope you enjoyed the lesson. Join us again soon. Bye.